Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are pleased to have you this morning. Uh, our topic for today will be pelvic endometriosis, um, basically how to manage it, and is the management that is currently used effective for the management for the problems that we have with endometriosis, or is it ineffective? So, so I'll try and go through today through surgical management, and then another time go through medical management. Uh, for, for the purpose of CME disclosure, I mean, I disclosed my uh, research and grants from Hologic, although it is irrelevant to endometriosis, but uh, we'll discuss today the surgical options, and in the, in the second topic, we'll discuss the medical options <coughs> for the management of endometriosis. Be, before I, um, I, be, before I, I, I go in any more detail, I, I just want to say what is endometriosis. Endometriosis is the presence of the endometrial glands and the stroma around it in areas outside the endometrium. That's basically the definition for endometriosis. What, 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 what is endometriosis? It's disease in the, you know, could be in the pelvis, could be outside. Most of the time it's within the pelvis and characterized by the presence of those glands outside. Those glands, if they go in the uterus, it's called adenomyosis. If they go in the rest of the pelvis, it's called endometriosis. Of course, they can go outside. They can go in the pleural cavities, diaphragm, lung, different areas of the body. There are three different kind of etiologies or hypothesis for development of endometriosis. Uh, if for anything, for the lack of better understanding on our behalf is why, why do we develop or why do, you know, human females develop endometriosis. Endometriosis would not develop in many of the animal species. Even in experimental settings, you, you cannot induce endometriosis. But it's very unusual that in the, in the uh, human female, endometriosis develops. In many, many of the animal species, you, you cannot. If you take endometrial glands and stroma and, and implant them, they would basically degenerate within a few days in the peritoneal cavity. The commonest thing, which I will show you plenty of pictures today, is to have those spots, those areas of endometrial glands and the so scattered all over the pelvis, typically behind the uterus. A different issue is to have it in the ovary. And when it's in the ovary, it causes a cyst known as endometrioma. So this would be a classic endometrioma. That's the uterus, the tube. So this is the fallopian tube on the right, the normal right over this little thing here. And then on the left side, you have this huge endometrioma that happens to be about to leak as at the time of uh, us doing a diagnostic laparoscopy uh, there for that patient. The etiology of ovarian endometriomas is, is almost completely different from the etiology of endometriosis that's on the peritoneal cavity. It is not retrograde menstruation and seeding. It is typically in vagination of the epithelium, you know, under the epithelium of the cortex of the ovary and development of, of basically a typical uh, cystic area there. So this is the second etiological mechanism for development of the endometriosis. <coughs> the, the third mechanism for development of endometriosis is basically some embryological remnant. Like last time we discussed the, the different, the malarian system and the Wolfian duct and so on. So some, some of those remnants could remain in, in areas and those could be stimulated to develop endometriosis. Like what? Like the rectovaginal septum. So we think there are three different etiologies and three different managements for endometriosis. So peritoneal endometriosis is just scattered glands and stroma on the peritoneum of typically of the pelvis. Ovarian endometriosis is totally different disease, has no relevance to that. And you can have ovarian endometriomas and you do not have widespread endometriosis in the pelvis. And then the third is the rectovaginal endometriosis, which is extremely symptomatic and has nothing to do with just having spots in the pelvis. So some women do have the whole rectovaginal septum <coughs> embedded with the endometriosis. So I just want to start with that. For, for the big picture, endometriosis could cause two things, could cause pain or could cause infertility. And the pain comes in a variety of ways, like what? Like pain during periods, dysmenorrhea, pain during bowel motions, pain without uh, you know, periods or bowel motions, just pelvic pain, or, or, or basically pain during intercourse dyspareunia. The, the infertility is a totally different story. For, for our purpose today, we'll discuss the infertility, but for the management of infertility, all the medical managements available today are of no use. I mean, basically, they're a waste of time. As a matter of fact, except in very rare situations that I will discuss, but in, as a big concept, the, you know, for, the, for women who have infertility, <coughs> giving them any of the available treatments today for endometriosis would decrease their fertility, would not, would not keep it the same. So if you take 
uh, you know, Mrs. Smith and she has endometriosis and you give her treatment for the endometriosis by Lupron or birth control or uh, progestogen, they are very good treatments for pain, but for infertility, the infertility will be less than her comparable uh, patient who have endometriosis and so on. So the treatment for pain is either surgery or medication. The treatment for infertility is either surgery or assisted reproduction, in vitro fertilization. And today we'll be mainly discussing uh, su in a surgery for the management of it. But this is the big picture. So, so any time that the patient comes, the first question is, you know, is what is your goal? What is your next step? So if her next step is to have a baby, then of course all those medical managements are out. If her next, if her, she says, no, no, I don't want to have any more family, you know, children and so on, then her options depend on many things, including her age and, and so forth. So this is just, um, you know, to, to, to start uh, putting the, the, the background information for you. For the management of pain, basically, there are treatments that were used in the past, like, for example, giving them denazole, giving them testosterone, and so on. We don't use any of those anymore much. There are treatments currently used, which are three things, which are progestogens, like, for example, norethindrone, birth control, and lupron. These are the three current treatments for endometriosis. There are future treatments that will be employed very soon in the treatment of endometriosis, like what? Like selective progesterone receptor modulators and like aromatase inhibitors. These are, these are things that will come within the next two to five years. I mean, all the studies have been completed. And then finally, there are future research like matrix metalloproteinase inhibitors or VEGF inhibitors. So, so there are four groups of treatments depending on what the patients would like, uh, you know, would, would fit into each of them. This is as far as pain is concerned. What about fertility? Again, to give you a background, does it affect infertility or not? So if you say, for example, take a normal woman, patient, patient with good ovulation, patent fallopian tubes, husband, good sperm, if they try every month, every month they have about a 20% chance. So this 20% chance of trying converts statistically into what we call a fecundity rate of 0 0.2. So 0 0.2 in fecundity rate means that if they try every month, it's 20%. If they try a year, which is about 13 cycles, then this 20% results in becoming an 80% chance per couple per year. If they try two years, that's about a 90% for normal couples in two years. After two years, 10% of all couples will remain infertile. So, so this is the background information. To compare against it, the endometriosis patient. So if you take a patient with endometriosis, regardless of the stage, and then you, you, you compare her with that, the fecundity rate drops from 0.2%, which basically means the 20% odds, to 2% to 10%. So it will be as little as 2 and as high as 10. Why as little as 2? Because there is nobody called 0%. Anybody has a chance as long as they, they, you know, they, they, are, they, they are ovulating occasionally and the tubes are open. But 2% but is a very low fecundity rate. So this shows you the magnitude. The average is about 0.04% you know, fecundity, which means about 4%. So it's dropped from a 20% to 4%, which is significant. If you look at all women who, have, who, pres all women who present with infertility, and you, you do diagnostic laparoscopy on all of them, then approximately one out of four to one out of two will have some degree of endometriosis. Not necessarily that the endometriosis is the only reason or is the contributing factor. Conversely, if you look, if you, if you look at all women with endometriosis, approximately 30% to 50% of all those women will have infertility. If you look at the prevalence of endometriosis in infertility, approximately 48% of women with infertility will have endometriosis. Complete contrast to that with the, the present prevalence of endometriosis in tubal ligation. This was an old study done in Chicago by Harris Hassan. He looked at all the women he's done tubal ligation and found that only 4% of them have endometriosis. So again, these are women who've had four or five kids, have no problems, and despite that they have four or five kids, 4% have endometriosis. So some degree of endometriosis is normal. Some degrees of endometrial glands and stoma is normal. In general, if you, if you look at women who have endometriosis for any reason when you diagnose them and confirm them, histologically as well as uh, surgically, they have eight times the odds of developing uh, infertility compared to their counterparts. So this is our background information uh, in this setting. Again, two, two, two channels, one is pain, one is, is uh, infertility. The pain is best managed by 
medical treatment, simple medical treatment like what? Like progestogens, cheapest, simplest, least side effect. If progestogens don't work, then you have two other options, GnRH agonist and birth control. Birth control is a little bit less than progestogen. GnRH agonist is good, but has lots of side effects and can be used for short periods of time. In the, in, the, in the next future, in the next two to three years, we will have two things. We'll have selective progesterone receptor modulators, uh, which is like selective estrogen receptor modulators, except, of course, they work on the progesterone receptors. They are very effective for the uh, endometriosis. And also you will have aromatase inhibitors, which are currently employed both for ovulation induction as well as for breast cancer. In the far future, you will have another group, which is the matrix metalloproteinase inhibitors and the VEGF receptor blockers. So, so this is our uh, background information. Does every case of endometriosis require laparoscopy? For the majority of them today, yes. I mean, in the future, there will be other measures to diagnose endometriosis other than laparoscopy, but for today, is, uh, everybody needs a laparoscopy diagnosis. This is one exception. This is actually a patient from Liverpool. Uh, England, uh, 70 years ago, she was such a remarkable case that m most of her uh, pathology is still in a specimen in the Royal College of Gynecologists in London. Th this lady had a bad endometriosis, so she had a cyst, they did a laparotomy and removed the cyst. Another uh, time, a year later, she removed another cyst, then eventually she had a hysterectomy, they removed the, the uterus, she still had all those nodules of the endometriosis along the midline. All the um, umbilicus had endometriosis, so she used to menstruate every month through the umbilicus. They removed the umbilicus, the specimen is still in the Royal College. They went back and they removed those nodules. Five years later, she comes with, after removing both ovaries and the uterus, she comes back with ovarian remnant, and they, they remove it, and it's an endometrioid adenocarcinoma, and the patient eventually dies from endometriosis. So this is, of course, an extreme degree. It shows you all the typical problems that could happen in one patient. But for the majority of patients, you really do need to have uh, uh, laparoscopy to, to diagnose it. How, how does it, so, so, so I'll, I'll divide the next part into three parts. How does, it, how, how, how could it cause infertility? And then is all the treatments that we do, you know, useful in any way or are we just treating because we are already there and is this effective or not effective at all? So basically endometriosis is four stages. This is, there are many classifications. The most widely classification used worldwide is the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. So it's classified into stage one to four. One being minimal, two mild, three moderate and four severe. So for the moderate and severe, you and I would understand how, how does infertility happen because basically you have tremendous adhesions. So the tubes get kinked or you had the fimbria occluded, although this is not common. Most of the endometriosis patients have the fimbria open. Rarely the end when it is closed or the adhesions happen, you have a hydrosalpings. And then finally, very, very, very common form is that you have endometriosis within the proximal part of the tube. The, the, so the tube at the isthmical portion have the endometriosis going through the wall of the tube, kind of similar to atherosclerosis that it narrows the lumen down rather than, uh, rather than actually that you have a block in the cavity of the tube. When it keeps going down, 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 the tubes get closed. So it's called proximal tubal obstruction. And if you confirm it in the wall of the tube, it is called salpingitis ismica nodosa. So salpingitis is just inflammation of the tube, ismica because if it's in the ismic portion of the tube, and nodosa, if you do an, an x-ray, the, the dye goes through those uh, parts, th those endometrial glands that pouch into the wall, and hence they are called nodosa because they look, literally look like shots. So, so you and I would understand why would this cause endometriosis. Uh, in a few minutes, I'll show you even minimal, even a few patients who have very few spots of endometriosis, it could be contributory to their pain. So I'll show you here some, some typical uh, you know, examples. Th this is a patient, and this is the left round ligament going from the uterus here down to the pelvic side of the wall, and you can see all those spots. So it could present with little vesicles. It presents with a copper staining, like here copper staining is a very common presentation. Once you see little murky fluid, typically in the cul-de-sac, that's suggestive of endometriosis. So even on ultrasound, if you do ultrasound and you see a little bit of pooling of fluid, uh, you know, of course, there is a normal range for fluid at different times of the cycle. But if you see that fluid, that's endometriosis. The two commonest sites is under the ovaries and blood levels. So you have to flip the ovaries. Once you flip the ovaries, you start seeing that endometriosis is stuck uh, under uh, there, as I'm showing you here. 
and also here on the surface of uh, the ovary. This is the, the right ovary, and it was completely, this was stuck to, to there. Once we separated, you can see this is in, in uh, ovarian endometriosis. We send them as separate samples so that the pathology can tell you, yes, you found it on the right, you know you did not find it on the left, and then each ligament. Again, this is superficial endometriosis on the right ovary. And like I told you at the beginning, the, the etiology of ovarian endometriosis is completely different from the etiology of peritoneal endometriosis or rectovaginal endometriosis. It has no relevance. It's a totally different disease in its pathophysiology and in its behavior as well. Again, here is seen as, as what we, they call burnt powder, uh, you know, all those spots here of, of endometriosis. Uh, and here, this is a, a close-up. So these are the two uterosacral ligaments, and these are spots of the endometriosis along the inside of the left uterosacral ligament, the second commonest position for development of endometriosis. Uh, th this is along also the left uterosacral ligament, uh, and, and, uh, and endometriosis is prevalent uh, there. Sometimes you see this is the back of the uterus, and this is the over, and they're stuck normally. As you know, this would be free, and you see those spots. You, those spots could be one of two things could be endometriosis going to the, to the back of the uterus and infiltrating, or could be adenomyosis and going from the inside of the uterus going to the outside, so going from the inside of the uterus to the outside. So it could be adenomyosis or it could be endometriosis. Again, you do your biopsies, we remove each one of those separately and you free those adhesions between the uh, ovary and the uh, uterus as well. Again, close up on that, and those are fluffy, and they bleed on touch because all they bleed on touch because all the area there is inflamed, and because of excess of vascular endothelial growth factor in those uh, spots as well. This is the back of the pelvis, and this is a close up on the cold the sac. This is the right uterus, <coughs> and you see all those vesicles. Uh, she, 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 com her, her co only complaint is rectal pain. I mean, she's not trying for babies or anything like that. She has severe rectal pain and severe uh, vaginal pain on sitting. We, we, we biopsied every one of those. There was like 20 or 40 of them, and all of them did not turn out to be endometriosis. They turned out to be endosalpingiosis. So endosalpingiosis is a similar disease where the lining of the tube implants. So you can have implantation of the endometrial glands and stroma, which is called endometriosis, or the lining of the fallopian tube, which would be termed in this case endosalpingiosis. This was, uh, you know, uh, done. This is the, the same case, but we pulled back, and you can see that she's a young patient with very strong uterosacral ligaments, and the typical fluid that is there, that murky fluid, that is not pus and not blood and not clear fluid, that's almost um, pathognomonic for, uh, for endometriosis as well. Uh, rarely, the, the tube festoons like that. I mean, most of the time, the tube is normal. It's either blocked at its proximal portion, or you have a slight dilatation of the ampullary portion and then narrowing before the fimbria. So you have a normal fimbria, but right before the fimbria, you have a pre-fimbrial phimosis. And those you can just put the scissors inside and make one cut inside, for, you know, one blade of the scissors inside the tube and one outside and make one cut. But this is classic. We push die and push and push and push, and you can see that the fallopian tube is becoming sausage shaped. Of course, normally you push the die and it runs through the tube. Um, uh, immediately. I'll come back to ovarian endometriomas, which I showed you at the beginning. Uh, ovarian endometriomas are important for pain and for infertility. They are very relevant for infertility if they are big. They are irrelevant if they are small. So if you find a one centimeter ovarian endometrioma, one to two centimeter, the treatment is nothing. For if she's just trying for it. You do not go and remove it you, because the risk of damaging the area around it on the ovary is bigger than removing. If you find a four to five centimeter, then you have to remove it because it takes the surface of the ovary so the eggs do not have a room to go to the outside. Also, it will limit your access and, and further it will uh, you know, complicate the monitoring. When you come to remove it, and we'll discuss that in a few minutes, basically you have to open the capsule of the ovary, you have to, 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 to pull it open like that and peel the two together. We, we had a, a patient last week with five large ovarian endometriomas, each was a grapefruit, and then the colon was ba you know, backed on it. We peeled them one by one, because if you remove, I mean, it's very easy to just you know, clamp those ovaries and remove them in two minutes, but at the end, I mean, she's still trying for a baby. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the procedure here, the, the scrub is described by a Belgian gynecologist, a guy called Jacques Donnet. 
If you open the, the, the cyst and you remove it, many times you get away and it peels beautifully. But many times at the end it bleeds from the very last bit. So the, as they say, the surgery always starts beautifully and ends up catastrophically. Mm -hmm. It starts beautifully because you know you peel and it peels very, very nice and there is a plane and then ends up that you have bleeding at the end so you buzz and buzz and it and, and becomes a disaster. So this was developed by Jack Donnay. He said, well, remove the majority, don't remove the last bit, and go and do something. At the, I mean, at the time, laser was very favorable in gynecologists. We, 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 I mean, the last time we used laser is almost 20 years ago. Uh, you know, and, but, but you can use electrocoagulation for sure and, and remove that. Will it damage some of the ovary? It will. But, 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 but you have to, when, once, the, once that capsule is 5, 6 centimeters, you have to remove the cyst. You cannot open and drain the cyst. It will recur within maximum three months. So the patient will come back, and we see that all the time. You know, the, the ovary is you know open, drained, you know, irrigated five, six times. Literally within two to three months, the patient complains of worse symptoms, and then the whole surgery becomes more difficult uh, as well. Th th this is classic. Also, all those 50, 60 spots there. Th these are suggestive of endometriosis. So we said there is vesicles, there is burnt powder, uh, there is copper staining of endometriosis as well. What, what about women with mild endometriosis? Why would those women have a problem with fertility? Really because of three reasons. It is possible that the whole process changed the milieu, changed the environment. So in the peritoneal cavity, you find excess of prostaglandin F2 alpha or prostaglandin E. You can also affect the sperm binding and the sperm motility. And, 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 and actually 20 years ago or more than that when uh, actually one of the fellows here you know, the, at USA did a, did a very interesting study. She, she did a diagnostic laparoscopy on all those women and aspirated that fluid before she started to irrigate. Took the fluid outside and took normal sperms and put the sperms there and showed that the sperms which were motile became immotile immediately after that. Uh, and that was published in the Fertility Sterility about 20 years ago now. Interleukins, very, very high in that fluid. Macrophages, large number of studies done actually from upstate New York showing you the, 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 the changes in the macrophages and the changes in the lymphocytes that happen uh, within, the, um, within the peritoneal fluid. Finally, two things, and these are very important. At one point, I'll get your videos on those of them. The endometrium is not a static organ. So when you shoot an ultrasound and you measure endometrium, th this is just a, a, like a black and white picture. But really, that endometrium moves all the time. There are four classic types of waves in the endometrium, depending whether they go from the fundus to the cervix or the cervix to the fundus, and sometimes the irregular. Th these have been very well defined. So there is a disturbance of the type of endometrial movement that normally happens, and this is one of the relevant causes for expulsion of the embryos, whether in spontaneous pregnancies or in assisted reproduction. And finally, the myometrium itself is affected, whether the patient has adenomyosis or not. The presence of adenomyosis is debatable whether it does impair implantation or not, but certainly the myometrial movement is significantly uh, worsened if, if you do have an endometriosis. So this is one reason. Second reason is it simply interferes with the ovulation process, whether by changing the follicular environment or, or, or disrupting the, the, system, the, the whole system of ovulation. How, how does it change the follicular environment? The, the, again, vascular endothelial growth factor is one of the essential factors for the ovulation. It disturbs that. It also changes the, 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 the concentration of, of, uh, of interleukins within the follicular fluid. What about ovulation? Very small proportion of endometriosis patients have those issues, like have hyperprolactinemia. So normally, you get patients with endometriosis, if you check their prolactin, they will be mildly elevated. Of course, in a different range from patients with prolactinomas and tumors, like for like what, like like the, the, the prolactin would be between 20 and 40 as opposed to being 200 to 400. Abnormal follicular genesis in the sense that the follicles typically grow one millimeter a day at the beginning and then grows two millimeters a day towards the end. There is a abnormal follicular tracking there. You could have premature follicular rupture and luteinize and rupture. It, the, 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 the follicles don't pop. I mean, this is rare, and it, it used to be a popular concept, but now it is rare, and the maximum it contributes to about 4% of all anovulatory processes. And then finally, the second half of the cycle becomes disrupted, known as luteal uh, phase defect. Do you need laparoscopy for every patient or not? In classic you know, reproductive endocrinology for decades, the patients would not be accepted for referral until you did laparoscopy. With all the changes in, in healthcare worldwide, it became that 
you do what is most effective. So, of course, it, is, it could be more efficient to treat the patient than to diagnose her, particularly in the U.S. where the diagnostic process is an expensive process. So, laparoscopy became a second line, like you treat them, and then if they fail, you, you, you investigate them. Is this good medicine or bad medicine? There is one study that specifically addressed that, was published for Tethys to 80, 10 years ago. They took 100 patients who were treated according to this concept. They came, they, they think they have some symptoms of endometriosis, so they treated them with ovulation, simple ovulation induction, and uh, with or without insemination, and then they failed. The 100 patients failed, so they scoped the 100 patients. A third of those 100 had severe endometriosis. A third of those hundred had mild endometriosis and a third were normal. So basically the odds that the three patients you treat empirically without looking at have a 60 to 65 percent chance that those patients do have some pelvic disease that cont contribute to their uh, endometriosis. So how do you treat those patients and is the treatment any good? Many of the standard treatments that we do every day are very questionable because basically they have not been subjective to, uh, to, to, to a rigorous assessment. So one of them, if you have a few spots of endometriosis, is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is it a waste of time? So, 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 so nobody really addressed that until literally 20 years ago. And uh, people said, well, you have a few spots here, and the tubes are open, and she ovulates, and her husband has normal sperm. So picking those tubes, burning them, or excising them, is this any good to the patients to conceive or not. Again, the patients have few spots there. So there are two prospective randomized <coughs> controlled trials that has ever been performed. The first one was done in Canada, is known as Endocan. Was a big deal enough that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which they usually you know, do not focus on those issues for their publications. And the second stu study was published two years later by the uh, infertility group in Italy, the Gruppo Italiano. So, so let's first look at the, the, the Canadian study. It is the world's largest study until today. There's only two studies. It looked at 341 patients. They followed them for two years. So the patients would go in. There were seven centers in Canada, including McGill University of Toronto, in, you know, Vancouver, uh, and, and they scoped the patient. If the patient is found to have endometriosis, they get randomized in the spot. They call a number from the OR, and they get randomized. To what? To either removing the endometriosis or do nothing. So half the patients remove the endometriosis, half the patients do nothing. So those patients who the endometriosis were excised, they, they are this group called the excision group. The other half whom they did nothing and they didn't tell the patient were the control group. It was in a prospective randomized control trial and double blind. I blinded, of course, from the patient, but not by the surgeon. <laughs> so they found that the excision group had a monthly fecundity rate. And I explained to you at the beginning the fecundity rate. So I said, for example, somebody's odds is 20% that con you know, is, is like a, a, you know, a, a 0.2 fecundity. So the monthly fecundity rate was about 4.7%. Like the odds of this woman getting pregnant per month is about 4.7%. If you did nothing, it's about 2.4%. This translates to a, to, to a ratio comparing the monthly fecundity rate between the groups of two. means that the odds of this patient, after you, you just burn those endometriosis or excise them, that is, is two, which is a significant number in this setting. The cumulative pregnancy rate means that if you leave her for a certain period and see whether she gets pregnant or not, it's called cumulative pregnancy rate. So that cumulative pregnancy rate is 17% if you do not do anything, and it's 30%. So I want to remind you about two things, that even if you do nothing, 17% will conceive, which is the control group. I mean, the, not everything that we do contributes to, to, to outcomes, and there is a lot known as infertility independent you know, outcomes, like, like people who would get pregnant. So one out of six, and remember, these are mild, so the tubes are open, versus 30%. Is this significant? Yes, very significant. The, the P was less than 0 0.006. The live birth rate was not reported. Again, big deal was New England Journal, Bar Ma Ma Marco and Mayo in, in, in Montreal were the main uh, authors on this one, published in 1997. Two years later, the Italian group did a study, much smaller study. It took 91 patients. They followed them for a longer period, four years. The patients were a mixture between surgery and between uh, be between giving them treatments after the surgery, uh, including Lupron and other stuff. There is no monthly fecundity rate calculated for that purpose. There is no cumulative pregnancy rate calculated for their study. They looked at the live birth rate per patient, how, how many individuals had a live baby, and there was 22% in the control group and 20% in the excision group. So the difference was 
non-existence. So the conclusion of the first study is significant doubling of the pregnancy rate. The second study, the prospective randomized trial, there was no difference between the pregnancy rates between the two. When you put the two together, well, th these are the only two studies. This is the whole world literature as, as relevant to this issue. So uh, the, the, the Cochrane database did a meta-analysis on, uh, on that, and actually one of my former partners is, is, is the author on that. He, he, did, he, did, he did a meta-analysis on, on this study, took the two studies and put them together, the study by my Marco and Mayo and the Gruppo Italiano, and he found that despite that the two studies are contradictory, the final outcome was favorable in terms of increased fecundity. So the current evidence that, uh, th th that it does affect the outcome is, is there. Uh, interestingly, in some of my friends who recently took their uh, oral boards, I mean, somebody would open the case and then they ask them, uh, you know, Mrs. So and so, you should have the stage one endometriosis, which is the lowest stage, the minimum, and, and you appear to have done, and then he looks and he says, yeah, we have burned the endometriosis or laser that we've done, whatever. And then she opens another page, like, you know, 20 uh, pages there, and say, well, the Mrs. So and so had stage two endometriosis and he did nothing <laughs> because the operation was diagnostic laparoscopy. So it shows you that he, he's contradicting his own. Uh, you know, practice within the small group of patients that he had for one year or so. Uh, and this happens really a, a lot because uh, the, the practical setting is, is, is different from the uh, theoretical setting, but the evidence today based on those two studies is that treatment of minimal and mild endometriosis is effective in terms of relieving uh, those uh, symptoms. Again, the combination, the, the odds ratio from 2 to 1.64, but the, the, the confidence intervals was 1.01 to 2.57. There is no question that there is. Um, and, and the reason for that we don't know, because those areas are not involving the tube or the ovaries and so forth. Does it matter what kind of surgery you do? Does it matter whether you burn them specifically? Because the lasers are gone. So do you electrocoagulate or do you excise? So, so this was one study, almost on 100 patients. This was later laser from the old days, from, from actually one of my partners in London, Sam Abdullah. But lasers are gone. Uh, this is, again, uh, superficial endometriosis, deep endometriosis. There is one study from, from McGill University in Canada, Togus Trilendi, it, uh, the, 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 the major surgeon there, random, uh, actually looked at electrocoagulation in 45 versus excision, cutting it out in 53 uh, patients, and found that the pregnancy rate was the same the abortion rate or the miscarriage rate was the same, the ectopic pregnancy rate was the same. There is one recent, uh, one, one more recent study that I think is one of the studies for the, uh, for the American Board the Recertification, looking at the outcomes of patients after excision versus electrocoagulation, and it was favorable for excision more than electrocoagulation in terms of relief of symptoms and so on. It is my personal opinion that excision is significantly superior to electrocoagulation, I, I think that today electroagulation is a good thing, but part of the past. It was very useful with regular laparoscopy because all you can do is to go to a spot, pick it up. But once you burn, you fuzz the whole area, you can see what is under it. So that endometriosis could be one millimeter, two millimeter, four millimeter, could be very different. And you're just burning the surface. When you excise it, you go to the healthy margin, you pick that peritoneum and cut it out. Also, you have a specimen, not just for confirmation, but I mean, I, I, say, I mean, like one of the patients we did last week, we sent 18 different specimens. And, and it's not just being fussy, but you want to know that the right over was endometrioma and so on. So, so it's my personal opinion that excision is significantly superior to electrocoagulation. Uh, unless technically there is a, there is a reason uh, not being able to uh, to do it, and in which case definitely you can uh, electrocoagulate those patients. So this is minimal and mild. What about moderate or severe? Do you do surgery? Do you do ART? Do you do both? So let me tell you first, show you, th these are the issues that I'll discuss with you. What is the reproductive outcome after surgery? Is it good or bad or non-existent? Is there evidence or no evidence? If surgery is done, does it improve assisted conception after that or it doesn't improve assisted conception? If you find the patient who's diagnosed, do you offer treatment or you, 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 you sit tight and wait and, and, and do nothing about it? And then finally, if the patient fails to conceive after one surgery, do you reoperate on that patient or do you do assisted conception? And then do you use agonists and so on prior to IVF or not? This is a specific point. So let me first focus, does surgery work? for those patients. Today, up till 2014, there is no prospective randomized control trial that has ever been performed to determine whether surgery in severe endometriosis improves the pregnancy for those patients who have stage four compared that if you just do nothing. 
There is no prospective randomized trial. There are three large cohort trials that were done uh, by, 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 by three very uh, well, well renowned surgeons. Uh, David Adamson in Palo Alto was one of the pioneers in, in 93, 20 years ago, published a series of about eight or ten articles which are probably some of the best clinical articles for the management of endometriosis. Uh, and, and he found that actually the surgery has an, I mean, does some improvement, but there's no difference between you know, mild and severe, but this is not the main point. The main point is he achieved about a 45% pregnancy rate, which is even higher than if you remember we said in the, in the, uh, uh, in the New England Journal trial, it was less than that. There was also a, a Japanese trial that showed that surgery is effective, and the difference was significant between mild and severe. And then the, the, this was the, David Goodsick, who is, is the, uh, he's actually the dean in, Ups, in uh, Rochester, New York. He, he, the, at this time, there was four stages. Uh, he did the study stage by stage, and there was no difference between the stages in outcome. means that even in severe patients, you can improve them some. Uh, so, so, so based on those studies, Again, they are not controlled, they are not prospective randomized control studies, but he took patients with endometriosis that, you know, that, that he operated on and saw what, what outcomes he could achieve and compared them to patients with endometriosis that at some point the, the, nothing was done and they were referred, for example, to them for assisted reproduction and showed that surgery does have an impact. The impact of the stage is not much, which is another topic to discuss, but it is not the main topic of this issue. So does surgery work? it appears to improve the outcome. So again, for infertility associated with endometriosis, the primary treatment is surgical. The secondary treatment is assisted reproduction. Medical treatment has no place in the management of those patients. It worsens their prognosis. It actually, they are lower, they have a lower pregnancy rate if you treat them compared if you do not treat them. If you do IVF, uh, anyway, because she's, everything is stuck together. If you do go and do surgery before the IVF, does this improve the outcome of, of IVF or not? This was a study from Spain, from uh, Garcia Velasco, actually my co-editor co on the book of endometriosis, and he looked at the outcome, and in, the, in one of the best centers in the world, there was no difference in outcome whether you treat them surgically before IVF or not. There was zero difference in the outcome. So many, so doing the surgery just before IVF does not have, of course, except if, I mean, there are many, many exceptions, as you know. I mean, if, for example, if the ovary is suspended up here and you cannot reach it because it's stuck with, with an endometrioma to the pelvic side, well, you have to free that ovary and bring it down, otherwise you will technically not reach it. Or if she has a six centimeter endometrioma that, um, that obscures vision, uh, that also is a problem. The, how, 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 what is the proximity between surgery and, uh, and doing the, the assisted reproduction? It, it could be anywhere from six months to one year. This is a study done by, by Eric Sari and Bill Schoolcraft from Colorado, and, and it shows you that there is no difference. Like, I mean, if she has IVF in January, does it matter if I do it now or December? It really doesn't matter uh, for that purpose. This is again by, by, by Paolo Versellini from Milan showing you the odds of pregnancy if you do surgery versus if you do surgery and then after the surgery hit them with a bunch of medications like what like lupron birth control or, or, or progesterone and he shows quite clearly here that there is no difference in the outcome so giving those patients a six month of this treatment or that treatment is not going to improve their outcome for fertility it could improve their pain management particularly if you did not excise it completely what would you would you use assisted conception or would you wait and see? Because many people like to, to wait and see, and many people like to move on to assisted conception depending on many things, including availability of services uh, and so forth. So somebody like that, the cold sac is totally destroyed. Then, of course, then assisted conception is very useful. But there is, again, no prospective randomized trials that ever randomized patients between the group. But this was a Canadian, there was actually a Japanese study and a Canadian study. This is the Japanese study, was, was published in the American Journal of Fertility and Sterility, and it showed the efficacy whether you do IVF or you wait and see. So they looked at patients whose tubes were not blocked, because of course they were blocked, then they need IVF. And in those patients, they compared the outcomes between the group who went through IVF and the group who did not. And amazingly, the group, uh, you know, the, the, there wasn't that big, big difference, but I mean, the, the, there was some difference to the group that had the IVF had a, a little bit higher pregnancy rate. But they tried to, 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 to look at it into more detail. How quickly did they conceive? And also, uh, is there an age effect? So the two were correct. They conceived quicker 
And the younger patients, it doesn't make a big difference, but the older patients, it makes a big difference. So the conclusion of this study is two things. If you have an old patient, you advise her to go ahead and move immediately. So what is the definition of old in this setting? It is 32 years, which is amazing. 32 years is considered old in this uh, setting. <laughs> this is the second trial, which is the Canadian trial. The Canadian trial looked at, at, at the treatment with, with IVF versus control and actually was not significantly, uh, was, did not make significant difference. So these are the two studies uh, that were done. If IVF failed, do you operate again or do you send them for assisted reproduction? So there was one study from Canada, from, from McGill University, was, was performed by Pegidis and, and Dr. Falcone, who's the current chair at uh, Cleveland Clinic. And it looks at, at the patients with stage three and four and looked at patients who had a second surgery versus patients who had IVF. And uh, the outcome was significantly different. For patients who had a second surgery, the outcome of pregnancy after three, seven, and nine months were 5%, 18%, and 24%. If they had IVF, the outcome was 33% after one cycle and 70% after two. So there is no question that even one cycle of IVF was much better than uh, surgery, and two were definitely uh, better. So the conclusion is that uh, if, 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 if surgery fails, then you move immediately to assisted reproduction uh, rather than wait, particularly if the patient is uh, 32 years or more in age. W which protocol in IVF, it is not our setting today to, to, to discuss which protocol of IVF, but indeed the, the, there is evidence that if patients have two things, have very advanced endometriosis, but still have good ovaries, what is known as good ovarian reserve, then those patients would benefit from giving them GnRH agonists for two to three months. But if you give GnRH agonists and the patient have a very low ovarian reserve, then those patients would not conceive after uh, I, I, you know, IVF because they will not respond. So let me uh, give you, th this was a study by, by uh, Samuel Marcus and Bob Edwards, Professor Edwards at, uh, in Cambridge, Bornholm. And uh, they down-regulated the patients for three months before the treatment. So this is the only exception for what? For the use of medical therapy in patients who want to conceive. That if patients have stage four and they still have good ovarian reserve, then you should downregulate them uh, first. Uh, and when they downregulate them four months, they conceived more. So this was, uh, the, 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 the was the concrete evidence that there is improvement in pregnancy rate if you downregulate. And a Cochrane database meta analysis confirmed the same. Let me talk to you in, the, in the, my last point before showing you a couple of small videos on, 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 the, on the implantation with endometriosis. Lots of studies, when there is lots of studies like that, you don't need to look at the tables, you find that the results are contradictory. So the early studies in the 80s showed that it, it, it diminished the pregnancy rate, and then the 90s showed that it, 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 there was no difference in the pregnancy rate and the implantation rate, and then finally now we think it does decrease the implantation uh, rate. So the main question that I want to pose to you this morning, with, when women with endometriosis go through different treatments and they fail treatment, is it an egg problem or is it a uterus problem? That's just put, put it simply. Is, is the ovary producing bad eggs or is it the uterus cannot receive those eggs and keep them for uh, a little while? Difficult question. We, how, and how can you reach a conclusion? So this is a study from Spain, from a group in Valencia in Spain, Carlos Simon, and he did a three-part study, part one, part two, part three, to be able to reach, is it an egg or is it a uterus problem? So the first study he did, he basically compared women with tubal factor, her tubes are closed, versus women who have endometriosis. And look here at their pregnancy rate at the embryology as well. So there was no difference between those patients in the number of eggs retrieved. There was 12 eggs in the tubal factor, there were nine eggs or 10 eggs in the endometriosis. There was no difference in the fertilization rate. It was about 60% of the eggs that were picked were fertilized. There was no difference in the number of embryos that were retrieved. So it looks so far that the patients who have endometriosis have no difference from their counterpart <coughs> women who have tubal factor and do not have endometriosis in terms of the number of eggs in the fertilization rate. But look at the pregnancy rate. The pregnancy rate is extremely low, 37%, which is a good number for tubal factor, 15% for endometriosis. So what happened? He concluded that it must be the uterus. 
because you got almost the same number of eggs, 12 versus 10. You got the same fertilization rate, 60% versus 50%. You got the same number of good embryos, 3.6 versus 3.5. But when you put them, you got a 37% pregnancy rate in the uh, tubal factor versus 13%. So his first conclusion was, it must be the uterus. So he said that the dialogue between the embryo and the endometrium was clearly altered in these patients, that, that there is an effect of endometrium. But the factor responsible for this impairment was initially unknown. And he felt at this point that it must be the endometrium that could be blamed since the two clinical parameters regarding the oocyte quality, which is the fertilization rate and degrading of the eggs, were normal in the endometriosis patient. So in an attempt to resolve this dilemma, he said, let's do two studies. The first study, he will take eggs you know, and, and do an egg donor in different recipients. So some recipients will have premature ovarian failure, some recipients will have endometriosis. And see, does the endometriosis affect those women from receiving the eggs? And then in the final part, he reverses it. He takes eggs from different donors and see if the donor, the cause of the donor's infertility affected the outcome. So when he looked at women who have premature ovarian failure versus women with endometriosis, there was no difference in the pregnancy rate between the two. So he concluded then that the presence of the endometriosis did not impair the uterus, because if it impaired the uterus in endometriosis patients, then it would, they would not have gone pregnant as much as the premature ovarian failure. So he, he, his conclusion in part two is exactly the opposite of his conclusion of the part one in the same study that was published in Human Reproduction. And this is the data there, that pregnancy rate in women with premature ovarian failure was 20% versus 25% with embryo. Taken, taken that there was 50, 70 patients here, there was 10 patients with embryo. So when you have 10 patients, if one of them have a problem, it's 10% of your outcome. So, and he acknowledges those limitations. So this is the outcome according to the recipient cause of infertility. He's trying to see if, if, if the eggs are all good eggs because they are donor eggs, and then the recipients are different, does it make a difference or not? And then the final part by Carlos Simon, he did the same study, but with eggs based on different donors. So he took eggs from fertile women, perfect women, polycystic ovaries women, unexplained infertility, women with blocked tubes, women whose husbands have sperm problems and they don't have any female problems or women with endometriosis. And again, he found here that the pregnancy rate was significantly lower when you take eggs from women with endometriosis. So it's again the opposite of part two. So part two shows that it's the recipient. So he concluded correctly that there is a combination of the two elements, that there, are combi that, that there is a, um, an egg problem and there is an endometrial problem. So let me summarize to you what is the current evidence, what is the, what is the recommendation of all the society. First, we do acknowledge that there are very few randomized control trials. You have to take into account how old is the patient. So a patient who's 26 years old with minimal endometriosis and open tubes could be managed with very simple things. A patient who's 37 years old with moderate endometriosis or even mild endometriosis should be enhanced or should be encouraged to go immediately for treatment. How long is the treatment? A patient who has been married six months and been trying at the age of 29 is different from a patient who has been married 10 years and she's now 39. Totally different. Family history, women with endometriosis, their moms tend to have endometriosis. Pelvic pain, because if she has pelvic pain and infertility, the only option is surgery. There is nothing else that will affect that. And of course the stage. I mean, there is no question that stage four endometriosis, even with assisted <coughs> conception, have half the pregnancy rate of stage one, which have half the pregnancy rate of women whose tubes are blocked altogether. So, so, so this is one very important issue. So the current stand that if you do laparoscopy, that all the visible lesions should be either removed or ablated. Again, it would be my preference definitely to excise them. We excise the peritoneum around them and go as deep as the fat under them until you get a clear marsh. In women with stage three to four, if they are very young, then you can use simple measures like fertility drugs and insemination. If they are older, then they should immediately go for assisted reproduction. And this is the current clear recommendation uh, for, for those uh, women. And if, if you did surgery once and the patient comes still with infertility a year later, and you, have think that you, you think that you have done, accomplished a reasonable surgery, then do not go for a second surgery. The outcome is very low. I mean, there is a pregnancy rate, but the pregnancy rate will be about 5% after three months to as much as 12% after one to two years, which is very low for those patients. So it is better to consider assisted reproduction. Let me show you a couple of uh, small, uh, short videos here, uh, showing you some, some of those patients, if I may.
so, so, so uh, you see, I, I eventually learned. In, uh, the, the, so this is a patient who've had endometriosis and have had a, a, a for, you know, has, has conceived the first time, has a C-section. So the first part shows you the, the whole anterior wall of the, uh, of the abdominal wall is completely fused to the, to the uterus altogether. So for patients who've completed their families, the best option definitely remove the uterus. I mean, anything else is a total waste of time. The, the removing the ovaries depending on their age. So if the patient is young and do not have lateral pelvic side wall symptoms, keep the ovaries and advise her that she will require one or two or three more surgeries from 25 until she's 40 or, 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 or 45. If the patient is old, then of course remove uh, the, um, the ovaries at the same time. All in this setting being completed her family and she is in her early 40s or late uh, 30s. This is different from the normal patients who are coming for like abnormal bleeding and so on, you would conserve those ovaries. So here we, 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 we're showing, that this is the ureter, the right ureter uh, the, during the case, and this is dissecting the pelvic side wall. So the treatment for those is mainly, you have to have a lateral pelvic side wall approach. You cannot go from the midline and keep working out. So this is the pelvic side wall, the peritoneum is lifted uh, parallel to the infundibular pelvic, infundibular pelvic ligament is here and the peritoneum is lifted by the PK, and then with the scissors you incise the peritoneum and keep going out. You keep going out until you create a window, and then from, uh, from that window you, you diathermize the infundibular pelvic ligament twice uh, and then cut it. Then you have to put the uterus on a stretch, because if you don't, two things happen. First, the, the tissues are thicker, so you do not get a good coagulation with the PK. Two is that the ureters are closer to... Uh, to um, you know, are, are closer to the uterine arteries when you take them. When you diathermize the uterine arteries, you divide them. It even would be better that we would have made an incision here and pushed that bladder down and down before we do it. Now the, 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 uh, the, the, per the peritoneal flap, this is the bladder this way, this is the cervix and the uh, cup that way, and the um, peritoneum is being divided here. And then going from, from uh, this side, we are cutting the peritoneum. You can cut it with one of the two blades so that you open the scissors and take the blade and, 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 uh, and, and divide the peritoneum uh, come until you get a good release of the bladder down and of the ureters out. Once this has been accomplished, then immediately uh, you know, you, you're, you're capable to, to, to open front uh, or back. So again here, this was uh, you know, the, the, the tube has been previously obliterated, and here diathermized twice, and then <coughs> divided. Of course, not, not all hysterectomies take eight minutes. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the PK again is used here, and you apply it across, you know, parallel to the, um, to the, in, in, the in the broad ligament, parallel to the uterine arteries. You stay outside. If you stay inside here, you get bleeding. So one of the <coughs> beautiful things here is that you literally could accomplish in, in somebody who has the whole uterus fused there, you can accomplish the hysterectomy with almost 10 milliliters blood loss or less. This is the peritoneum at the back. It's always favorable that you lift that peritoneum and you divide it down, going towards her uterus sacral ligament on, on the uh, left side in this setting. Again, you come back here. The left ureter is going here. This is her left uterus sacral. This is her right uterus sacral there. This is development of the uh, uh, of the space until you'll be able to identify the vessels and then diathermize them. And you can use the back of the scissors to do that uh, quite nicely. Here is the left ureter again. So this is the front. So this is the anterior abdominal wall. And this is her uterus. And, and, and the uterus is completely fused, so all you can see is the fundus. Of course, the cervix is about eight centimeter down there, from there. So you, you start, you use again either a single blade of the scissors and keep going down until you see the reflection between the peritoneum of the bladder and the cervix, and then you <coughs> fill the bladder and then cut it and then empty the bladder. So, so, so this way you avoid any, uh, you know, any bladder injury in this setting. And this, is, this would be a typical setting for opening the bladder, somebody who's had a couple of cesarean sections and, uh, and uh, so forth. So here we're dividing the peritoneum, and the beautiful thing is that you can lift the peritoneum, you take it layer by layer. You're seeing all those vessels, and this is, uh, and this is even with, with, with an older machine here. I mean, it's not, uh, it's not anything that is... Uh, the, the, the newer one is the XI. The, the XI takes you to another level. Uh, and I think the... Uh, 
the infirmary is getting the X-ray. So here developing the space and again making sure you had a good grasp with the PK, never pull on it towards you, I mean keep it down because if you pull on it towards you it, 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 it slips or it doesn't coagulate well. So this is the uterine arteries are here. This is the space between the left broad ligament and the left uterosacral ligament. So the patient had endometriosis both, uh, in a, uh, b both ovaries in this setting. The, 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 this is still attached. I mean, you can read it here, but still attached in that part. But at least we could see the side now. Initially, we could not see the side. All we see is the top of the uterus. We have coagulated it twice until you see a good uh, diathermy effect, and then with the scissors you cut. You always hold here, and then uh, diathermize twice, and then divide. And here again, we're. This is the anterior abdominal wall, and this is the uterus. It was at the beginning fused from this point. Now it is free to there. And then you keep taking that bit by bit. You apply, I mean, if, if you have a, an assistant port, so the assistant pulls on the uterus down, so puts this on a stretch, and you're cutting. If you're cutting, you know, and you're, you're, you're not sure if it's bladder or uterus, you of course cut on the sides of the uterus, but this side it was still peritoneal, so all this is peritoneal of anterior abdominal wall, and the tissue stretches nicely, and it, it does not, uh, you know, bleed there, but it is fused adhesions. As a matter of fact, in, in the old days with open and so on, this would be more difficult even to just get inside. Again, the uterus is put on a stretch, is much backward. This is the anterior abdominal wall. It is being released. Next week with the medical treatment, we'll show you somebody that had fibroids and endometriosis and bilateral tubal occlusion. So we did a neosalpingostomy yesterday on her and um, and myomectomy. So so. Um, so the vessels are picked. Peritoneum is pushed. We're looking also, of course, for the ureter to make sure that they are not involved. Again, here we're dividing that. best way is to open the scissors as use one blade of the scissors, apply traction down, the assistant could uh, you know, put a, like a, a, a tinaculum on the uterus and push it down. At some point you will suddenly start to see the plane, so we're for, for a change now we're seeing the plane here, and this is some uh, you know, adhesions also between the uh, lower part of the cervix and the bladder. There's always a fold of peritoneum that has some vessels going from the bladder down to the cervix, so we we'll pick that up and diathermize it. It's a PK, and then another application, the second application, always medial to the first one, so that you don't cause any lateral injuries. Most of the injuries are, are lateral injuries, so this is first application, second application, and then where you see your marks, you, you make your incision there. So now the, the fascia is being incised and with the back of the scissors you push once you push, how do you know that this is the vagina from the bladder? White fascia for the vagina. Here, yeah, the bladder is yellow. So, so here, this is this is the end of the cervix. This is the beginning of the bladder. We made that incision. We pushed it with the back of the scissors. Still some fascial adhesions down there. Look at the back. Two uterosacral ligaments still stoic uh, over there. The, this area is in this 
called peritoneal window is classic for endometriosis if you start having peritoneal window. So we're, we're opening the cul-de-sac, so this is the posterior cul-de-sac, this is the left uterus sacrum, this is the right uterus sacrum, and with one blade of the scissors you cut it. The, the assistant from down pushes it so that the cup becomes more prominent. And you see the cup is that green cup. There is two, two ridges in one groove. You try to cut in the groove. If you cut in the groove and the tissue is on stretch, you cut with almost no bleeding, uh, the, the, despite that this. But there is still an area that we haven't finished. So now we have pushed the bladder down where we think it is adequate. We open the back, but we still have to clear that and push it out so that we make our letter incision, as you will see in a second here. So this is going down here. The more they, pu they push up, the more the cup becomes prominent. This is the right side, the cup has been opened. When you go to the front, the, the assistant has to mo move the, the uh, beak here, turn it 180 degrees, basically flip it, and then we have it on a stretch. So we're opening the vaginal bulk. Now you see the cup, the uterus is totally free, has adenomyosis, has scar tissue. Uh, I mean, normally this would be three, four days in the hospital just recovering from a massive incision. The uterus is being pulled now through the vaginal bulk, so that is your vaginal uh, edges. There. So we, we, it looks uh, like we remove the left tube and ovary at the end. If you remove them at the beginning, they flip in the middle and keep getting in your way so you can't see. So you want to keep them till the end. This is our left tube and ovary. We're also putting it through the vaginal bolt. And this is the, the, the uh, suturing part. If, if the vaginal vault is wide, I take one to one angle and run it to one side, and then take one from the other angle and take it to the side. When you get it from front to back, then you take another bite and elevate the uterosacral ligament. This way you prevent any prolapse postoperatively. So literally what used to be a whole different operation is now you incorporate that to you beautifully in, in, uh, in two patients. So, so this, this would be a classic for somebody who's completed their family uh, and so forth. Uh, the, the, a couple of others that I'll show you maybe another time would be somebody who had endometriosis, rectovaginal endometriosis, had ovarian endometrioma, bilateral hydrosalpingesia, and n fibroid. So we do a myomectomy, close the myomectomy in two layers, then open the tubes and, and reverse them. You open the ends of the hydrosalpingesia if the tube is not too badly damaged, and remove the endometriomas at the same time. And I thank you again for your attention this morning. I hope I haven't kept you too long, and I look forward to seeing you.